Good morning, boys and New Hope family. Hope this message finds you all well. Hope you're having a great week. Hope you're having uh, fun this morning. Want to pick up where we left off last week. I'm backtracking just a little bit. I'm here online to catch up to where we ended in um, the in-person Sunday school class. I uh, want to back up a little bit. This week we want to talk about uh, a little more about the official whose son Jesus healed, as well as chapter 5, getting to the man at the pool of Bethsaida, who Jesus also healed him. Um, and last week, he spent a lot of time contrasting the Samaritan's response to the people of Galilee and their response when Jesus came, how one accepted Jesus at his word and the other demanded signs and miracles to prove that he was the Son of God. And so we had that contrast last week. And this week, we want to pick up that conversation again, as I said, with uh, the official son, and we'll move on from there. So we're going to start um, in chapter 4 uh, of John, excuse me, we we'll start in verse 43 today. Um, and if you recall, Jesus was in Samaria. He went to Galilee, and now he's coming back to Cana. So let's pick up in John 4, 43, and we'll see where this takes us. Uh, this is 43 to 54. It says, After two days he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen that he had done all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, and they had been there. Uh, so then, verse forty-six. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water to wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him. You will never believe. The royal officials said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with news that his boy was living. When he inquired as the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And so he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. Um, so here we have this um, second time Jesus in Cana in Galilee. Um, now we see this official, who's likely a Roman official, a non-Jewish official, seeking out Jesus, concerned for his ill son. Um, he traveled roughly 15 miles to find Jesus because he knew that Jesus was in the area. He was from Capernaum and Jesus was up in uh, Cana in Galilee. So this official traveled about 15 miles to find Jesus. And once he finds Jesus, that afternoon he begs him to come to Capernaum to heal his son. And Jesus at first chastises the man, saying, Look, you have to have signs to believe. But the man says, No, no, come and heal my son. In other words, I don't need you to show me a sign here. I believe who you are. If you come, I know you can heal him. So this official is putting his faith in Jesus before the signs Jesus does for him. And so that's kind of the difference that you're contrasting the Jews and the Greeks in this time period, or the Romans, where this Roman official believes in who Jesus is, that Jesus has this ability to heal his son without seeing the miraculous sign from Jesus first. So Jesus simply tells the man, go, your son will live, and the official returns home to his son. Because he's traveling 15 miles, it takes him two days. Remember, he left Cana in the afternoon, came back to Galilee the next day, and his servants met him and said, Look, your son's alive. He's okay. And they inquired when that happened. It was the same time Jesus told him that your son lived. And because of that, he and his household believed. And I think that's an interesting statement, that because of this miraculous sign that Jesus did for this man, from being miles away, never being close to this boy, Jesus healed him from miles away. Because of that, this man and his household believed in who Jesus was. So I think there's a couple of conclusions we can draw from this. Um, first, simply that Jesus has the power to heal. And second, that we've got to seek him out. You know, as I think about this, Jesus stayed miles away, yet from his word, at his word from afar, he altered the course of that boy's life. Um, with words like that, Jesus proved that he is Lord of the entire earth and that distance doesn't mean anything to him. He can have power over anybody at any time. And not simply Jews, but all, all the people. He spoke and it happened. It's any wonder that this man's household believed. Um, or consider this, 
The man didn't wait for Jesus to come down to Capernaum, but he sought him out in Cana. He knew Jesus was near and decided to go find him. And do we have that kind of faith? That's kind of my question to us. Do we go where we know Jesus is working, or do we simply hang back and expect him to come to us? You know, the Bible says in Hebrews, the Lord is near to those who seek him. And so even as established Christians, those that are um, in our faith and mature in our faith, we still have to seek him. We can't simply wait for Jesus to come and work in our lives. We have to actively seek him to maintain that relationship with him. We can't get complacent uh, as followers of Jesus. Because there's always more to learn about him, always more to see him doing. He's always working in our lives. And so we can't just rest because we found him once. We have to continually seek him day after day, just like the sufficient. He came to him because he knew Jesus was in the area. He was working in the area. So the official came to him where he was working. If we see Jesus working in our lives and the lives of somebody else, do we go and join him in that work? Or do we simply stand back and say, oh, he hasn't come to me yet. I'll wait until Jesus gets to me. Because I think if we wait for that to happen, he's going to pass us by. And so we have to actively continue to seek Jesus and his workings in our lives. And there's a couple things that we can learn from that official. Jesus can heal, and we have to seek him out. And so speaking of healing, let's move into chapter 5 now. So here Jesus leaves Caperna, or leaves Cana, excuse me, and comes to Jerusalem. And specifically comes to the Pool of Bethsaida. And this Pool of Bethsaida has a long history. Um, from what I've been able to glean in my researching, the pool was established about 800 years before Christ. So it's been around for a while. And during the early first century before Christ, um, some of the Greeks believed that that pool was dedicated to a healing goddess, and that's where the healing came from in that, in that pool. Others, like our text, um, believe that this pool was used by God to heal people at various times. Um, and so the pool has a long, kind of complicated history to it, we don't know where this healing um, actions came from, if it was from the Greeks or beforehand. We don't know where that impl impl implication came from. Uh, but we know that this pool has a reputation for healing those that are close to it. Because as you'll see, there's people surrounding it waiting for the waters to stir to heal them. So let's read John chapter 5. This is just verses 1 through 15. John 5, 1 to 15 says this. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus replied to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jew said to the man, and so, I'm sorry, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. That's just through verse 15. So here's a man who had been waiting at this pool for 38 years. Um, and given the response, it sounds like he was still waiting there, and the waters are still being stirred for to healing people. And so he just hasn't had the opportunity to make it in the pool to receive that healing. And so it really it seems like he had a lot of a competition to get to that pool first. And if he's an invalid and can't move, he depends on somebody else to move into the pool, and when that happens, somebody else beats him down, in, down into there for those healing waters. And so I just can imagine the mass of people lying around waiting for the waters to move so they can have the opportunity to be healed, spend the day watching the water and begging for their survival. And I just think about this people just sitting there putting all their hope on this one little pool and in walks Jesus. He comes into this scene and he asks this man who had been sitting there for 38 years if he wanted to be healed. 
It seems like a funny question to ask a man who'd been in that condition for so long if he truly wanted to be healed. Well, I had an experience recently like this. Um, I was lamenting that over the years, my weight has increased a little bit. Um, and this person challenged me that I hadn't really done much about that. I hadn't really done anything to change my eating habits, change my exercise habits to correct that. Um, but I think we've all found, met people in our lives like this. They just want everyone else to know just how hard their life is, just how rough they've got it. Um, you know, if I really wanted to lose this weight, I would have done something about it instead of just sitting there eating another cookie, so, you know, taking one for the team. But Jesus asked the man that same thing. Um, is he happy being sick because it gives him an excuse to be pitied? Or does he truly desire to be well? Is he happier just being that, what was me, and lament me and help me out? Or does he actually want to be well and healed? And Jesus asked us that same question. Um, do we truly want to be healed? Do we want to be changed? Do we want to be transformed? And we just, we got to be careful with our Bibles, folks, because it just might change our lives. And Jesus is telling the man the same thing. If you want to be healed, I can do that, but it's going to change your life. Are you sure this is what you want? Is that what you truly desire to have your life changed? The man says, yes, I've been waiting for this for 38 years. I'll do it. And Jesus simply tells the man, pick up your mat and walk. In other words, I've healed you, so get your stuff together and leave. You don't belong here anymore. Um, you are healed for something better than this. You don't have to sit here waiting around. Uh, so this, of course, will get the man in trouble with the Pharisees because he's carrying his mat. It's likely all the possessions the man has he's carrying with him. And the Pharisees are getting in trouble because they want to know who gave him permission to carry his mat on the Sabbath. Um, Jesus later finds this man in the temple. And so the man must have been well enough to offer, presumably, a thank offering for, to the Lord for this healing. And tells him to live in such a way that worse won't happen to him. But really, what could be worse than living for 38 years with an illness? How about separation from the Lord for eternity? How about living a life that causes others to stumble? You know, so Jesus is cautioning the man, look, you might be used for the last 38 years playing the victim to looking for help, to being dependent upon support, but don't rest in that anymore. You're better than that. You've been saved for more than that. Don't rest in that victim mentality, but move into that righteous living mentality. And so Jesus is really warning the man to not take this healing for granted. So once the man knows that it's Jesus who healed him, he tells the Pharisees that he, that it was Jesus, and this, of course, will lead to challenges for Jesus in the coming chapters. But what about all this? What do we? What application we gain from this man and his healing? You know, I think first is he truly desired health. He wanted what Jesus offered. And Jesus isn't going to impose himself on anybody. He never says, oh, you need to be healed. And do you want to be healed? Um, because the love of God isn't, is about giving somebody the opportunity to make that choice, not choosing that for them. Yet he asked the man if that was his desire. And the man said, yes. And like the official, we need to be willing to seek Jesus out for that healing. Some of us, to be frank, are simply like the man waiting at the pool for someone else to come along and move us to health. We're waiting for someone to help us physically, mentally, emotionally, or otherwise. We're just waiting for Jesus to come and show up. Yet when Jesus appeared and was allowed to act, that transformed this man in ways he never thought possible. After 38 years, I can imagine he started giving up hope. But Jesus came into the scene, and Jesus gives him a life worth living for. I think Jesus wants to do the same thing for us. He wants to take our lives and not to discount what's happened in the past, but to move us to a better place in the future. Like that official son, he healed from afar. He changed the course of that boy's life from afar. And he showed up in the man at the pool and was right in front of him and said, look, be healed and walk. Go, this isn't where you belong. Be better in the future. I think he makes the same offer to us. So we can be better in the future, to be more like him in the future. So, Lord, we thank you for this morning, this time together. And, Father, I pray that is the cry of our hearts, Lord, is not to become comfortable or complacent with where we are, but to always seek you just a little bit more, to seek you more today, to become more like you today than we were yesterday, Lord. And, Father, may we be like this man who truly desires healing, that we don't go back to sitting at the pool, but we go on to lead a better life. Father, help us to lead a life that is more reflective of you in all we do. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So thanks so much for joining me. Hope you have a great week. Remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.